but we work closely as a team, as you all have heard, so we kind of cross over a lot when we need support. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what our data looks like, 73% uh, of our caseload reflects the demographics of our county. So it's very small, students from small rural areas, low income, and predominantly African American. 73% of our caseload are males. 60% of our caseload are secondary level students. That includes middle, high, and early college students. 20% uh, of our students are special education students. 66% of our students have repetitive disciplinary referrals. And 53% of our students um, on our caseload experience severe emotional related behaviors and mood disorders. Um, some of the issues that we address um, can include, but are not limited to, uh, stress, anxiety, bullying, family problems, depression, um, concerns regarding uh, learning disabilities, alcohol and substance use, um, self-harm, uh, suicide, grief and loss, um, all of those things can be addressed in our program. And then lastly, uh, we have 44% of our caseload who have experienced safety concerns regarding self-harm and, and suicide. And those numbers kind of reflect those numbers that I showed you earlier. Um, thankfully, having a school-based mental health program on site um, has been beneficial because we were able to identify these needs immediately and address them immediately. Um, and we're thankful to be able to say that we have had no cases of suicide that were completed. And um, that is really big for us. Um, I mostly do secondary level students. So I see a lot of high school students, high school seniors, who you would think are happy about graduating and finishing up their educational career um, on that in that level. But they want to end their lives. And so I'm, I'm glad to be able to pour in the support for them. And we've had a couple of students who have gone off to graduate and have gone to college. So they see a hope for themselves, and that's what it's all about. Um, something that we are interested in piloting is uh, with the success of our telehealth program, we really want to implement telemental health. Um, with Atrium Health as well, um, with the necessary funds to be able to do that. That would be beneficial for our county. Um, even though our two clinicians are working overtime to make sure that we're servicing our kids, we know that more support is needed, and we're welcoming any uh, support that can come our way. Um, our motto is where greatness grows, because we definitely grow greatness in Anson County. I mean, yeah, we look like a little small dot on that map, but um, we're doing some big things. We're really doing some big things with the right amount of support. We cannot thank our, our state uh, Student Health Advisory Council enough. They definitely believe in the work that we're doing. Um, they are guiding and helping us with our resources, and we definitely appreciate that for sure. Um, we definitely serve the whole child. We take a holistic pro approach. Um, as you see, that child is in the in the center because the kids are at the center of what we do. Um, and, but we know that other factors affect them. So we do what we can as a team to kind of just help make life a little bit easier for them so that they can focus on what they need to do, and that's to get their education. So thank you. So our next presentation, Ed, um, thanks again to Anson County Schools. They've done a lot of great work and really appreciate them coming. It's a long drive and the pouring down rain to come here today, so we really appreciate them. Um, some other work that we've been doing to address some of these needs is um, collaboration with our partners at DHHS around a unified school behavioral health action plan. Um, this has been really exciting work and, and really glad to, to be at the table for this work. A lot of times we work in isolation, and this is one of those times where we really came together to do some great work. And uh, so to present this, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Charlene Wong. She's the Assistant Secretary for Children and Families at DHHS, and she's going to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing and what our strategic plan looks like. Thanks so much, uh, Chairman Davis and Vice Chair Duncan and Superintendent Truitt. Really appreciate having the opportunity to share some of this work. 
I'm going to skip this slide because there's a crisis, and you all have just seen all the latest North Carolina data on that. <coughs> I think with those data, we know that the response and the leadership and coordination of all of our um, entities is really important. And that by doing this work in schools, we can really promote equity and access to supports and build resilience in our children. Um, North Carolina is really being recognized, I think you've heard that many times today, for the good work that we're doing in school health. We were selected as one of only five states in the country to participate in a learning collaborative and received very deep technical assistance and support from the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials to really support us in generating this plan that I'll present today. And I just want to really iterate and emphasize that this is a plan that we developed very in a very coordinated fashion working over months together. Um, really not just our two departments, we also brought together some of our external partners, some of our philanthropic partners, with the goal being, let's see what we've got, what's missing, and what do we think we together need to prioritize so that we can actually make the most difference for students right now because we know things are not great for, for too many students. So these are just some early insights from when we were looking at what we currently have available in North Carolina and where we see some of those gaps. We didn't have a centralized repository. We had some great policies. Some of them were overlapping. Certainly we know that there is a lack of the behavioral health workforce, particularly to work with children and particularly to work in schools thinking about what sort of funding challenges and flexible options are needed. Um, and, the, you know, one of the things we did identify also is that we had a lot of great partners in this space, sometimes, however, working in silos. And a lot of this effort was to bring those partners together so that we could work in a coordinated fashion. So in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to walk you through. These are the six strategies that we together have prioritized that are included in our Unified School Behavioral Health Action Plan. So next slide, the first one is we're very excited about a statewide electronic health record documentation system. So this is essentially being able to have health records documented electronically so that, for example, if a student moves from one school district to another, Right now, because we have many schools that are still using paper charts, you know, often uh, the school they move to just doesn't have information about them. Let me give you an example of a child for whom, you know, something bad could happen, has happened in North Carolina. You have, say, a fourth grader who has asthma and who has panic attacks. The school they came from knew about how to help manage and treat those two things what sorts of signs to look for to be able to tell? Is this an asthma attack versus a panic attack? That child and their family moved to another school district. The child has an episode at school, and because currently, unfortunately, that type of health information is just not easy to transfer from school to school, that new school is in a really tough position to know, what do we do? Do we give her her inhaler? Do we help do calming techniques? Do we need to call 911, right? What's the right thing to do? We're excited that this type of statewide electronic health record documentation system would help a child like that one I just described so that that next school that that child has just entered has that important information. Next slide. And so they'll be able to respond more effectively in a crisis. There's also, obviously, if you can think about paper chart records, there's a lot of concerns about privacy and security. This type of electronic system that we use in all of our health systems is certainly much more secure than having those paper records. We are also, you know, I'm part of the Department of Health and Human Services, which includes our Medicaid agency. This type of electronic system will also facilitate the type of billing and reimbursement that's needed for these services, which is so critical. The second strategy, I feel like the Anson team just set us up perfectly here, is doing more of these telehealth-based programs in schools that specifically focus on behavioral health. Um, we know that right now only about 10% of schools in North Carolina have, will have telehealth services by sometime this year. Most of those are focusing on physical health, which is very important. With the data we've all just been looking at, we know that behavioral health and getting more of those clinical supports is really critical. 
I will say I am a practicing primary care pediatrician myself, and I love when I'm able to get any of my patients their therapy arranged that they're receiving in school. Because in general, for most children, they'll require weekly, every other week therapy. And when I get patients who have that delivered in school, I know they're getting it on a weekly basis. It's so much better for the child. It's better for the family. On the next slide, they're actually missing less school because you can imagine they're just being taken out of the classroom for that session versus my patients who are going to another therapy appointment or having to get pulled out for a whole afternoon to get that appointment, for example. We also know that in North Carolina, when you look across our counties, we have over half of our counties where we don't have a child psychiatrist, where we don't have enough behavioral health workforce to work with children. So this type of telehealth arrangement and delivering that in schools where children are is really a great way to increase access to these clinical evidence-based supports for kids. The next strategy is one maybe some of you all have heard of. It's called Project Aware or Project Activate. Um, we have in North Carolina several school districts that have received federal funding, time-limited federal funding for these types of very comprehensive programs that are focused on supporting students' behavioral health through things like new policies, I think we've heard it's all about relationships and building those community partnerships. So, for example, working with a local university to place counseling interns in schools or expanding behavioral health services for students. I will share that, for example, in one of the districts, um, they have really multiplied the number of, uh, Leah, some of the types of workers that you mentioned in your question earlier, right? The social workers, the school counselors, the behavior support technicians. This funding and these programs have really helped these districts to support these. We have three of our districts um, that are going to be hitting a funding cliff for this program that we know is making a huge difference for students um, on the next slide. And we're looking to sustain these particular sites for a couple more years so that they can really work to get fully sustained in perpetuity. But here, just as an example, these are data from our North Carolina sites. Our Project AWARE sites in North Carolina saw, on average, a 91% reduction in suspension rates during the first three years of the program. Obviously, that is huge. We also saw huge increases in services, 500% more students screened for behavioral health needs, 19% increase in the provision of support services for students. And these particular districts that we're talking about sustaining funding for for two more years are serving uh, 4,300 students with intense needs and screening over 24,000. So huge impact programs here. The next strategy is really focused on those relationships, as we've again heard over and over about, over and over again about today. So this is linking schools to their behavioral resource networks. This is actually something that we in the department and the Department of Public Instruction have worked together on using some one-time COVID dollars that have become available to us that Ellen referenced, that we are working with schools and convening them with people around them, the health insurance payers, behavioral health providers, primary care providers like myself, boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, other organizations that are in their community who are there and who really work to support behavioral, emotional, mental health of children. Because what we were hearing from schools is that sometimes they felt like they were on an island, you know, and then they, did, they just didn't have the relationships. They didn't know the people around them who were in their community who could really help support them. And so we have a group that is really now hand-holding to connect dots, build those relationships, um, as well as helping schools to participate in a structure that we have all over the state. It's called system of care so that you not only have those relationships, but there's also a structure in which then those folks coordinate the care and the supports for children. So we're looking to expand what we're doing already with COVID dollars now and to be able to expand that. And you can see the types of investment here, the return on investment is huge. For every $1 we invest in this type of building of relationships and coordination, we get $11 back in reduced dropouts, improved test scores, shrinking achievement gaps. 
It's shack all the time, evidently, this meeting. <laughs> so one of the strategies also included in the action plan for which we're looking at lots of different funding sources. We're starting with some COVID dollars that we have now, actually. As Ellen mentioned, we're providing that flexible funding to districts because I think some of the questions earlier are, it might be that some districts have different needs. And so really letting the shacks determine what are those needs in their own community. Uh, this year, using those COVID dollars, we've made six $60,000 available to all eligible shacks. I and mean, then on the next slide, we're seeing them already make plans and using those dollars for evidence-based programs, again, that have so many great outcomes, increasing graduation rates, improving attendance, reducing bullying. And then the final strategy, perhaps some of you all have heard of the program Mental Health First Aid and Youth Mental Health First Aid. These are training, sort of similar to what the Anson County team had described. And this is really a training all about how to teach both adults, so school staff, as well as students, how do you identify when someone's having a mental health emergency and what should you do when you recognize that? You know, there are some great example quotes at the bottom here, and I've had some stories that I've heard myself around, you know, a child who was asking to go to the bathroom at sort of an odd time in class, and a teacher who had been through this training was able to recognize Wait, something's like not right about the way that student's behaving, the way that they asked and recognized that actually these were some symptoms of a behavioral health emergency that was just starting to really escalate for this child. And because she had gone through this training, she knew the types of things to do to intervene for that child as early as possible. So with this um, type of training, we know, again, huge benefits here. Uh, we, the governor has been very generous and has provided year funding for the next two years, and so this is a program that we're just getting off the ground currently already. So in summary, on the last slide, these are the six different strategies that I just reviewed. I'm going to read this down a little bit. Um, the six different strategies that I just reviewed are the six that are in the North Carolina Unified School Behavioral Health Action Plan. You can see that there is investment needed for most of the strategies I described. We're looking at all different sources, including potentially including some of these in the um, Department of Health and Human Services and Department of Public Instruction, next uh, budgets asks, as well as looking at other funding sources to be able to actually act on these strategies that we together have identified as being the ones that we think are going to make the most difference for kids now in this behavioral health crisis that we find ourselves in. Happy to take any questions. Any questions? Um, Just to clarify, because I noticed this in the Anson County um, presentation, when you're referring to a mental health counselor, Typically, that's not a terminology that we use these around this table of social workers, psychologists, nurses, and counselors. So what would be the training of a mental health counselor? Where does it fit into that? Which stra in which strategy are you? Are you I'm looking at uh, the mental health first aid, and it quotes a school-based mental health counselor. Oh, you know, actually, I can't speak to for that particular quote, uh, what type of school health counselor that might be. That training is actually mostly focused on other staff, including staff who have no mental health training whatsoever. So it might be teachers, folks who work in the cafeteria, you know, it's, it's really broad. And actually, the other thing we're planning to do with that funding for mental health first aid training, again, hearing from schools is, training school staff and personnel, as well as training folks in the community. Again, those partners that we spoke about, uh, because they wanted to make sure that their partners were also using the same language and rec being able to recognize and use the same types of systems. Thank you. Also, thank you for all the work you were doing with me. I was so thank you very much for your work. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Allison Schaefer, General Counsel for the State Board and the Department of Public Instruction. I am here to um, to talk to you very, very briefly <laughs> about the athletic role. Um, we have been. Uh, 
trying, well, we've been working on getting a, a rule passed uh, that deals with new, the new legislation from last session um, about the uh, working with High School Athletic Association and other associations on high school athletics. Um, the permanent rule is in your materials. The proposal, um, we um, initially had, uh, following the legislation adoption in November of last year, we had, um, I mean, sorry, in, in 2021, uh, in March of 2022, the board, this board adopted a temporary rule, which was a, a, a faster process, but we were required to move forward with adopting a permanent rule that outlines the relationship between the state board and the oversight responsibilities of the state board um, w with regard to high school athletics. The board, um, in October of 2022, approved the permanent rule, which only has one change from the temporary rule, which is to add an exception for requirements or meeting requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So you've already seen this rule a lot of times, um, but it is we are now at the point where we have advertised um, a, a public hearing opportunity. We did not have anyone come and give additional comments. Um, we only had one person under the temporary rule, and that was the group, the disability rights group that asked to have the ADA um, provision made. So we are here today again after we've been through the required advertisement period for you to adopt the final permanent rule. Once once you adopt it, it will um, go to the Rules Review Commission in at, at its, and it will hopefully come before the Rules Review Commission in its February meeting. Um, and if there are no objections, the rule will become final in Mar on March 1st. Any questions? We Again, we've dealt with this often and regularly. Okay, thank you. Sure, I know we went over time, but it's a uh, good day that we had. And again, appreciate the uh, scope of time. And with that, that concludes our presentation. Thank you, Mr. Keenan. And that last item will be before us tomorrow for action. Thank you, Mr. Keenan. Um, we'll now move to our next agenda item, which deals with the North Carolina Pathways to Excellence for Teaching Professionals. Um, colleagues, you'll recall that in our December meeting, we took action on this particular initiative in three ways. We uh, referred to Pepsi uh, requests to develop recommendations for how to launch pilots in school districts um, be uh, beginning as soon as uh, this coming fall school year. Second, we uh, asked the superintendent to perform an alignment study of the blueprint um, that Pepsi delivered to us around the pathways work and alignment between that document and the board strategic plan and operation Polaris, which we anticipate uh, getting in February. And then the third item, which is the subject of today's agenda item, was we asked uh, Ms. Schaefer, our general counsel, to uh, review um, pending statutes and policies with a particular focus on those that may need to be modified in order for us to conduct the pilots that we seek to uh, to conduct as a next step in this program. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Schaefer. Thank you again. Um, do you have a PowerPoint before you that summarizes where we are with regard to uh, the pathway, the consideration of a pathways program for modification of the state licensure provisions? Um, and I'm just going to go through the law very quickly and, uh, and where we are and then talk about what changes need to be made in order to be able to implement a pilot program as requested by the board. First of all, licensure statutes are chap Article 17E of Chapter 115C, and it sets out the requirements. Uh, and I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, the, uh, the state board under those statutes has the entire control of licensing applicants for professional educator, educator positions in the state of North Carolina and requires that the state board adopt rules for the issuance of all licenses and determine and fix the salary grades, et cetera. Um, the, uh, also, um, the legislation, the current statutes require the board to receive recommendation from Pepsi, which is the Professional Educator Preparation and Standards Commission, and seek input from the UNC Board of Governors, State Board of Community Colleges, Educator Prep Programs, and other public and private agencies as necessary, which, um, Again, Pepsi has been uh, taking the lead in considering a lot of these issues uh, prior to them coming before the state board. Um, again, the state statute requires the adoption of an, uh, of an application fee, which is in our rules at the, at the current time, um, and it mandates that before applicants for an initial, I mean, sorry, requires all applicants for an initial professional license or residency license to have a, um, a specific score, a minimum score on a standard exam, 
and also prohibits the state from converting uh, licenses to a permanent license unless the exam requirement is fulfilled. Um, those are some of the things that are in the statute that um, have been perceived to be uh, things that might need to be changed in order to make a, a better system. So that's why I'm mentioning those things specifically. The statute also goes through, the current statute goes through specific kinds of licenses that are uh, continuing professional license, but emergency license, initial professional license, limited license, and residency license. So it's very specific with regard to what kinds of licenses we have currently in the statute, and those are mandated categories. Uh, and there's much more detail in the statute about what each of those is. Um, uh, it also generally, uh, in order to get a license, you have to have a bachelor's degree, uh, unless you're getting a career technical license and there's some professional qualifications that can qualify you to get it. So that's very quickly what the statutes say. Um, there are a significant amount of, of, of uh, administrative rules already in place. Some of them are outdated. Most of them um, are very currently tied to the current statutes um, and require the implementation of the current statutes. I won't go into the detail, but it's in chapter subchapter um, 6C of the North Carolina Administrative Code. Um, and then there are current board, state board policies, which generally um, are things that don't need to be in rules or are things that are on their way to be converted to rules. Um, and those, again, the ones we have in place now are currently tied to very closely to the state um, legislation I just mentioned and went over very briefly. And PowerPoint has more details. I just wanted to get through this. Um, and then also, um, th just, just to recap very briefly, um, there are ongoing concerns about the need to reform the teacher licensure program to make um, additional pathways available to individuals who are interested in teaching to increase support to assist teachers in becoming and preparing for the classroom and to revise um, the system to allow more opportunities for professional growth while teachers remain in the classroom. So basically additional um, kinds of uh, categories of teachers that are, are mentor teachers or um, lead teachers and also to provide for higher, higher salaries. Um, this was referred to the state board in February of by the State Board back to Pepsi in February of 2021, recommendations coming out of different groups. Uh, in November and December of last year, the State Board um, heard from Pepsi about its um, 10 framework items that need to be uh, acted upon. I'm not going to go through those specifically, but just that there are um, things <coughs> such as uh, creating advance and lead teacher roles, um, uh, perhaps looking at different kinds of assessments instead of or in addition to or uh, as an alternative to uh, testing requirements, those kinds of things, and also building uh, a compensation model. Um, at its December 1 meeting, the State Board asked specifically for uh, what this chairman has already described, but in addition has specifically asked General Counsel to come forward with, um, at this meeting, with rules, statutes, and policies that would need to be changed in order to develop a program. And I was specifically asked to talk about the things that need to um, need to be considered for a pilot program. So um, the state board, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, next one, next slide, I think. Um, I'm sorry, go back. Okay, actually, we'll just stay right there. Um, so the, the based upon the request from the state board, um, uh, we are looking at the possibility of field testing and piloting programs, and so this, this, these suggestions are going to be lim limited to or, or focused on um, what's needed to do to create a pilot program. Um, so that, then that was at the request of the board leadership. Okay, so that's a very quick summary of the background, and um, the the the, I'm, the recommendations I'm going to make or the suggestions I'm going to make about what needs to change really are general because we don't have specifics yet to ask for very specific things. That's going to be developed and proposed by Pepsi and uh, with the input of the superintendent and her staff on, on other things. So I'm just going to talk about generally what needs to happen. First of all, you have if, if you have a pilot program that deviates from the regular general statutes, it requires specific authorization from the General Assembly. Um, if a pilot program is only going to be a, a relevant to the few pilots, you know, five, ten, however many is decided should be, um, then the current statutory structure needs to remain in place for those districts that are not going to be pilot in the pilot program. So what you're asking for is exceptions to the current legislative structure for the pilot districts and for the state board to create a pilot. 
Um, so their legislation would need to include uh, exemptions from specific requirements. Um, for example, um, a, a waiver of districts that uh, pilot districts having to um, com comply with Article 17E, which is the le current licensure statute. You would need that to be waived. Um, and then another example would be the exam requirement, which I mentioned before. If, the, if, the, if, there needs to, if the pilot program is going to look at alternatives to licensure, then you would need a waiver from that licensure requirement for the pilot districts in the pilot legislation. Um, it would also need to include, the legislation would need to include rights and duties the, for the state board and pilot districts that are otherwise not committed, are currently available in, um, and permitted by law. Um, for example, Right now you have specific categories of licensure. If you want to create new categories of licensure, there would need to be authorization to do that um, and to pilot those. Another example would be, or again, I think uh, there's been just some discussion about an apprentice license, for example, and that's not currently permitted in the statute, so it would need to be authorized in legislation. Um, uh, also, it would be important to have an exemption from rulemaking. As we all know, that's a very lengthy process. Um, it does not make sense to have a requirement that you make permanent rules, which takes about a year, uh, which are and which are set in stone. Uh, if you're trying to study and make flex make a flexible pilot program that allows you to be flexible in order to test certain things, so exemption from perm from rulemaking for the pilot program would be important, or at least require only uh, only the temporary rules or emergency rules that you might want. Um, Again, we have administrative rules in place, and we've looked at this in my office about whether you can uh, waive your own administrative rules once they are adopted in the administrative code. And the answer to that is no. You need to go through the whole rulemaking process to have exemptions from that. So we would also need exemptions from the current administrative rules or be allowed to exempt these pilots from our current administrative rules. Um, to the extent that the legislation would call for a different pay structure, we would, the, the, we would need the pilot legislation would need to allow uh, exemption for the pilot districts from the current pay structure that everyone else is required to comply with. Um, and um, then if, if there are additional funds that are needed, of course that comes from the General Assembly and would need to be allocated to support the pilot program. And um, no, pilot programs normally, uh, legislation, pilot legislation normally includes a structure for reporting back to the State Board and the General Assembly um, and how that's going um, on a regular basis. Um, and the, the last thing would be that there needs to be a multi-year schedule for, to accommodate how long the pilot program would go on and uh, how it would be implemented and assessed. Those are general kind of concepts that need to be included in legislation. The last thing I put in here is if the State Board does have, um, have any policies that are relevant, then those would, need to be, um, those would need to be changed as we see what the pilot program legislation might look like. So um, it's a lot of work. <laughs> uh, it's already been a lot of work. Pepsi has, um, is, has been spending a lot of time with this and still has a lot of work to do. I know there are other other pieces of this puzzle that need to come together, but that's generally what you're looking at in terms of needing from the General Assembly. Thank you so much, Ms. Schaefer. That was exactly what um, what we needed at this point in the process, which is to uh, foreshadow what changes might be needed um, in terms of, uh, once we know the specifics of how we want to conduct the pilots and what they'll contain, then we provide that feedback to you and your team to then help us uh, identify more specific Requirements, but those general requirements or items <coughs> that you outlined um, are not only informative to us about things that may change, but hopefully also are informative to Pepsi in their work at developing recommendations um, for the pilots. So thank you. Before I open the floor for general discussion, let me turn to my colleague, Ms. Kamnitz. Do you have anything to add to this? I, I think what you just said is exactly what we were looking for at this point, and it's going to be a helpful guide as we move forward. <coughs> Turn to the superintendent. I, I agree with you both. This has been incredibly helpful. Um, I, I, I feel like this lays it all out in a little bit more systematic way that um, helps me get my head around the steps that need to be, be taken as we move into the long session. Then I'll open the floor for questions, comments from my colleagues. I have a question. 
Dr. Oxendine. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. It does begin to <coughs> sketch out some things. My question has to do with uh, if my what or with what? <laughs> my New Year's resolution. Uh, speak in the mic. Um, <laughs> the, um, you made reference just a few minutes ago, I think. I don't want to get words in your mouth uh, with respect to the suspension at least pilots would have to have waivers, grant waivers granted. To, to do but something different. Opportunity coming out of the General Assembly approved by the State Board of Education, something like that. Um, would a waiver also be necessary for these pilot schools? Would a waiver be necessary around um, NESAS? I don't the, know. The North Carolina evaluation system. Um, be subject to the, the normal evaluation yeah. process? Uh, unless there was an exception made, it would they would be subject to the normal evaluation process. So that, I mean, I didn't try to list everything that would need oh, or I could need. That, I, that was just it, yeah, yeah, no, it would need an exception if there, if these folks in this program are not going to be evaluated with the, with the state instrument. It would need to be an exception. Thank you. I have some other questions, but they'll come later. Okay. <laughs> You know where to find me. Other questions or comments for uh, General Counsel? Mr. Hall. Thank you, sir. Uh, just quickly, I mean, it's not a question, just a comment. I think I'm clear now. I've been asked, is this going to happen next year? <laughs> I was in line at payday. Don't never go to the bank on payday. <laughs> <laughs> I lined up uh, and asking me questions about this particular item. And I understand now that there's no time frame. We don't know. might be five years down the road. Could be three years down the road. Um, so our, our current thinking is that uh, by our March meeting, we would like to receive recommendations from Pepsi on the pilots so that we have an idea of what to what legislative uh, changes to seek mm -hmm. in this com coming session with a plan, if we can move fast enough, to launch pilots in the fall, so next school year. Next school year. That's pretty aggressive. Um, and so as we do this work, we might have to modify that schedule, but that's, that's our current thinking. And then the duration of the pilots will initially we'll look to Pepsi for recommendations on the duration. We might also have to modify the duration depending on how the pilots are going. But I would imagine a minimum of two years would be the, the least that would allow enough of the process to work to generate results to be able to form conclusions about how to uh, implement a program more broadly. Thank you. Yeah, but, I mean, for most teachers, they won't even know what's going on because it's just going to be in their house. Be I mean, they're going to be aware that it is, I guess, but, I mean, it, it won't change anything for most teachers. Well, some of them will be able to provide more clarity. We'll be able to provide more clarity as this, yeah. as this develops. But we're, we're trying to move as aggressively as we can because uh, – Students and teachers sorely need these improvements and benefits, but but it's complex, and so we also need to be thoughtful about how fast to generate change. That's all. Anything else? Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. Thank you. All right, we'll do one more um, discussion item before we take a break, and I'll turn to Dr. Oxendine, Chair of the Educator Standards and Practice Team. Dr. Oxendine. I am Olivia Oxendine. I chair this committee, and joining me in that responsibility Miss Amy White. Uh, first of all, let me just say a wish of Happy New Year to everyone. 2023, finally arrived. <coughs> it will go by quickly. Um, tagging on to more about licensure. Here we go again. So this is um, LICN001. Uh, this is going to, this to me is kind of the mother load <laughs> in our policy document around the licensure of teachers in North Carolina. And I just want to commend uh, Dr. Chamberlain, who has spent, along with others, enormous time digging into LICN001. I love this body of policy, folks. I guess I'm weird. But he has done some necessary work to clarify the ins and outs of around uh, the residence license, around the limited license, around the emergency license, and around the commit to teaching. It, lots of ways that one can become licensed to teach in North Carolina. 
It's all spelled out in LICN001. So I will ask Dr. Chamberlain to step forward. This is going to be a very detailed presentation. You will not yawn. You will pay attention to all the ins and outs, the ins and outs of everything you've always wanted to know about LICN001. So come forward, Dr. Chamberlain, and have right. us. <laughs> Extend us a license. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I can assure you that this presentation will not be as exciting as that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are uh, addressing some um, requested uh, changes to uh, LICN001, and that is our kind of <laughs> guiding policy around uh, teacher licensure. Um, and the, the reason uh, for these changes are threefold. One, to provide clarity to the field on what the policies mean. Um, two, to align with current statute. And three, provide better readability and organization for uh, accessing the policies. So uh, some of these changes um, are, are minor and cosmetic, and I will be very quick and brief as I can on those changes. Um, some of them deal with more substantive issues that I will um, spend a little time on. So you can see the overview here. Uh, you have formatting and reorganization. Uh, the initial professional license conversion to the continuing professional license is something we will uh, discuss. Uh, the whole concept of the residency license, uh, which is the source of much confusion in the field. And just to let you know why, um, residency license began as a, as a licensure path on July 1st, 2019. Um, with that, came the end of lateral entry, which was June 30th, 2022. Um, the first cohort of residency license holders have, have had their license expire as of June 30th, 2022. It is very common that you don't see the problems inherent in the policy until there's policy, con there's consequences to those policies. And that's when the confusion begins and arises. And so that's what's driving a lot of this is confusion from the field about uh, the, the, the end of those residency licenses. And then we'll address emergency licenses and limited licenses. So converting an IPL to a CPL, um, in section 1.20a, we eliminated residency license from the section on the conversion because residency license needs its own section, much like we had with lateral entry. Uh, here we had the conversion process for both IPL and residency combined, and we've decided that's leading to some of the confusion, so we've uh, taken that out, residency license out, and put it in its own section. Section 1.20C, eliminated lang language related to employment in terms of the license. Um, a, a few years ago, the statute used to read that the, per that the candidate had to pass their um, licensure exams in the third year of licensure. And then it changed, modified, statute was modified to say in their third year of employment. And so uh, there was some holdover language in this section that referred to the, um, to the license rather than the employment, and we've corrected that. In section 120D, um, allowing out-of-state educators who fulfill initial ri re licensure requirements in less than three years on an IPL to convert before the end of those three years. So uh, according to our statutes, um, an out-of-state educator can only hold a CPL if he or she presents effectiveness data at the time of their application. So even if you're a 25-year veteran, if you come in, if you don't bring effectiveness data from your former uh, school system, then you're only eligible for an IPL. In the past, we've held those folks to stay in on an IPL for three years. Um, and with some consultation with the field, it was determined that those folks could go ahead. So we could still meet the, the requirements of the statute if we converted them uh, at any time after their first year of employment in North Carolina. So we're just making that change that out-of-state IPL holders, if they've got the required years of experience, can go ahead and convert that license to a CPL after their first year. Sections 150 and 150A referred to lateral entry licenses. 
We are removing all policies related to lateral entry license as it has ceased per legislation effective June 30th, 2022. Uh, there will be a, a little placeholder there that says what I just read you. Uh, that's right there on the screen. Uh, but the, uh, the actual policies uh, have been removed. <coughs> Section 160, qualifying for a residency license, clarifying that residency licenses are only issued at the A level and may qualify for experience credit and or graduate pay. Um, <coughs> this is uh, to avoid some confusion. We had some folks that may have done a master's prior to applying for a residency license and we're requesting that they be um, granted um, a M-level license and we're recognizing that M-level license, you can't hold an M-level license at a residency level, that it's only the A or bachelor's level uh, license. Clarifying that an individual who holds or has held a, 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 a residency license is not eligible for a permit to teach or an emergency license. So this is preventing kind of backflow on the licensure process. The way we have this structured is one can scaffold your way to a, a full license. That is, you can leverage a permit to teach. You can then uh, convert that to an emergency license and then to a residency license and then ultimately a CPL. So that allows people with no educational experience or maybe not the content knowledge they need at the, at the beginning to enter the system and, get the, uh, and address those deficiencies through the licensure process. What we're preventing here is that once you've entered that RL level, you cannot go back um, again to one of those um, temporary licenses. Uh, Dr. Talbot, I'm yes, ma'am. I, I don't want to interrupt because you're on a good roll here, but I do want to ask a, just a clarifying question. So, the, on the on the journey to a full license, a CPL, then the I think I'm correct. The permit to teach and the emergency license, it, those are not on that. Way to the CPL. They're outside the pathway. Is that correct? I, I'm not sure what you mean by. Well, we go from the I, uh, the traditional route is IPL on three years, and depending on passing the the, the SPE license exams, then on to the CPL. But the permit to teach the emergency license isn't on that scaffold. Not on the traditional route. That is correct. There's no place for those in the traditional route. This is about um, allowing kind of an on-ramp to that residency license for people who are career changers, who never did any kind of traditional preparation program. That's, that's my question. Yep. That's my, and you gave the answer. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, so next section, qualifying for a residency license. Um, <clears throat> so I have to provide some historical context here. So when we were making the transition from lateral entry to residency license, in policy, we stated that anyone who currently holds a lateral entry, as long as that lateral entry license is active, you can go ahead and switch over to a residency license. And we'll switch you and give you another three years on that residency license. If, however, you wait until the, the lateral entry expires, if and you don't meet the requirements to convert that lateral entry, then in order to, to hold a residency, you have to produce the test up front because we already gave you the three years under your lateral entry. Um, and, and now um, you, didn't, you weren't successful in that. To leverage an RL now, you have to show us the test up front. Um, this has caused quite a bit of confusion in the field. Um, and so we're clarifying this in the statute if this is the same teaching area, if your lateral entry license was in the same teaching area as your requested RL, you have to produce the, the tests up front and meet all of the re eligibility requirements. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. So uh, the lateral entry license went out of existence in June. That's correct. The RL replaced it. Well, the R so there was a period of concurrency there yeah. from June, July 1st to June 30th, 2022. Both things were, we had folks in both camps, the lateral entry camp and the residency camp. Um, now we've seen 
As of June 30th, 2022, we've seen the last expiration of any lateral entry license. And that's what's causing this confusion is some of those folks did not meet the, the requirements, the testing requirements specifically. Um, and they're now they're requesting a residency license. And our response to that is that's not the appropriate remedy offered by the General Assembly. The appropriate remedy to that is the limited license, not to give you another three years on a residency license and then have the expectation of then a, a limited license on the end of that three years. But lateral entry is no longer. It does not exist any longer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. Yeah. Yes. One more point. Justin here, what is the um, statute of time limitation between um, for, for the candidate to provide the test results and still qualify for the residency? So if they were previously teaching as a lateral entry, and that's no more, how much time could pass that they could then provide the required NCSBE um, pass the content exam. So this is going to come up in a, in a, in a later um, policy recommendation. So it's really difficult for us to put any kind of time frame on this. And so the, the way we've done it, and this is kind of a little spoiler for what's coming, um, the way we've done this is we'll give you all the time you need. But the caveat is you have to meet the requirements as they currently are under state board policy. So if I had a lateral entry five years ago and I was working on completing that, and here it is five years hence, I finally got it all done, as long as the requirements are the same in current state board policy, we'll, bring you, we'll, we'll accept you back. If those requirements change, you've got to meet the new requirements. And so that's how we've chosen to address uh, that's how we present it to Pepsi, and Pepsi did approve that, that recommendation. So to answer your question, I had an expired lateral entry, and I'm waiting to pass my test, and I pass my test. Um, the reality is, is that person wouldn't need a residency license because you just met all the qualifications to convert that license, and we would convert that license. Yes. Yes. That, thank you for sharing. You're that. welcome. Now, there is a question of, can I hold a lateral entry license in one subject area and apply for, an, and that expired and I wasn't successful, can I apply for a residency license in a different teaching area? And our review of the statutes and of policy does not indicate that that's, prevent, that's, un, that's disallowed by either statute or policy. So in the case where I held a lateral entry license in middle school science, but I couldn't meet those requirements, I can come back and request an RL in, let's say, middle school math. And I can pursue that as a resident without having to produce the test up front. Um, and we would allow for that, that provision. Clarifying for the timeline for renewal of a residency license. Um, the employing school system shall be responsible for verifying the candidate's enrollment in an approved EPP. A residency license is issued for one year and renewable twice within three years of the effective date of the original residency license. So full disclosure here, this is an area of, of some controversy um, that I need to make you aware of. So because of the testing requirements, the testing requirements have to be completed Three year, you get three years to pass those testing requirements. The argument is, can a residency, can you, can you hold the residency in year one, decide not to renew it in year two, come back in year three to renew it your second time, and then in year four renew it the third time? And while that may be allowable, the testing requirement is fixed at three years from the time you started. So that creates a real difficult situation. So um, in our interpretation here, we've said that the residency license may be renewed twice, but it has to be in that three-year window from the date of the original issuance of that license. The field has, um, has pushed back on this a bit and said this doesn't offer maximum flexibility. So what if a teacher went on leave of absence in one of those years? Can they come back and renew? 
Um, and that is the issue that's before us. I consulted with the chair of Pepsi about this, um, and he asked if I would go ahead and take this recommendation, disclose the, um, the, the, the comments from the field, and give you the opportunity to either pass it as it is or send it back to Pepsi for reconsideration. And this happened pretty late in the process, or I would have worked all this out before. So, um, so are you asked? Is that something coming uh, before the board officially tomorrow? Uh, I don't think we need to. I, I mean, I would say that's part of your action. This is for discussion. So, okay, um, for discussion. <clears throat> Clarifying requirements to renew a residency license. <clears throat> um, in order to renew a residency license in the, for the second or third year, the PSU must verify that the license holder taught at least six months in the prior year, and we use that as the definition of a year of experience. That's the same definition for how you accrue a year of experience. Um, continue uh, enrollment in an EPP, employment as a t teacher in the PSU, uh, and the required uh, professional development as described in, in later in this policy. Um, so that's the requirements for renewal of, uh, of a residency license. Clarifying the requirements to reinstate a residency license. If an individual fails to renew the residency license for either the second or third year, the current residency license will expire. Within three years of the effective date of the original residency license, a residency license may be reinstated at the request of an employing PSU provided that conditions two and three are met, and that's two and three from the slide above. So they have to enroll and they have to be employed. So what this is saying is my first year I worked with this district, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore, I, I, I went out my second year, a different LEA can pick you up and offer you that, that next renewal uh, as long as it's within that three year window. Um, and, and I just have to say that required some folks were viewing the residency license as kind of similar to a limited license, that it bound the employee to a specific PSU, and we wanted to make clarity that this, a residency license is not a limited license. It doesn't have that same uh, impact. <clears throat> Uh, we didn't write it in that plain and simple English, I have to say. I mean, we, I think we got to the outcome with that language, but I, um, no, that's okay. I, I, um, it's almost like poetry. You get kind of this policy um, <clears throat> prose going on. Well, um, we can, um, we can certainly um, take that back for, for consideration. Uh, clarifying that a residency license may only be converted to an IPL or CPL if all requirements for conversion have been met. Individuals must complete all requirements, including North Carolina State Board of Education required licensure exams, uh, tests, and receive the recommendation of an EPP to convert the residency license to an initial or continuing license within three years of the effective date of the, of the RL. The reason this is important and requires clarity is we have a situation that we have not been able to address, and that is a residency license teacher completes coursework in his or her first year. Let's say they only needed three classes, and they completed that coursework in the first year. The law requires that in order to hold a residency license, and renew that residency license, that individual must enroll in an ed prep program. But the program has already been completed. Um, we have worked. Se we have tried several ways to address this, including um, statutory changes to allow for a term like affiliate with the EPP. It's not that we want we want a separation between the residency license holder and the EPP, but something less formal than enrollment, which does have cost to the educator. Um, and so, but 
We, we have not been able to do this. And this is clarifying to the field that we can't, under law, we cannot move them from a residency license to an IPL until they've met all the requirements. That includes testing. So um, we're still, this is still a known issue that we're, we're trying to find really elegant solutions for. But as of right now, anybody who hasn't passed their test that holds an RL will have to enroll in an EPP even if they don't have coursework requirements remaining. Clarifying the requirements to convert an expired RL to an IPL or CPL. Once the residency license expires, the license may be converted to an IPL or CPL upon the recommendation of the state board approved EPP and completion of current licensure requirements, including testing, at the time of the conversion request. So this clarifies that if you have an expired RL, there is no time limit on when you can convert that. However, you must meet the requirements that are current state board policy. You cannot say, oh, I finished the test that was 10 tests ago and expect to come back. Um, you have to meet the current test as defined by uh, the State Board of Education policies. Clarifying the requirements to clear additional residency license areas. You can hold multiple residency licenses in, in various subjects. Um, and if you add a subject to a residency license, it is another residency license. And you must clear that license under the same conditions that, you're for, that you have for your first license. That is, you have to complete the program. Now, you could, the program could be concurrent. So you could be seeking a math and a science. You're doing all the same pedagogy requirements from your EPP. That's fine. But at the end, you'll have two tests. You'll have a math test and a science test to complete uh, to, to convert that residency license. Clarifying the timeline for conversion of an RL to an IPL or CPL. All requirements to convert a residency license to either an IPL or CPL must be completed before the expiration of the second renewal of the residency license. That's just reiterating. That's the same as the IPL language. Uh, you've got until the third year of, of your IPL to complete all those testing requirements or the license expires. A question would be great. I'm feeling a little... <laughs> feeling a little dry mouth here. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> all right, Section 160D, individuals who do not fulfill the requirements of a prior lateral entry license may be eligible to issue to be issued a residency license in the same area provided the following conditions are met, they pass the required test. This is, we covered this before. Uh, this is just locating it in the residency license uh, section again, so everyone is clear about that. Um, reiterate requirement for individuals requesting an RL in a different teaching area. So again, we, we go through the, if you had an, if you had an RL or a, a lateral entry license in one area, you can seek a different, a, a new RL in a different subject area without testing up front. Section 160D um, allows for current year waiver if the candidate was issued an RL without appropriate content testing. This is very important. Um, we have a number of folks. What they, what they did was they had a lateral entry license. They let it expire. This past year, they were put on an emergency license. And then, I'm sorry, the 21-22 school year, they were put on an emergency license. For 22-23, the district said, we're going to put them on an RL. We're going to put them on a residency license. Um, and they did not test. And um, our licensure staff did not catch that in some cases either, that those folks should have tested. And the, the residency license was issued without testing. So our proposal to the State Board of Education is that effective July 1st, 2022, any application for a residency license for which an RL was issued or requested without meeting applicable content testing requirements shall have until June 30th, 2023 to satisfy those testing requirements or the RL is not eligible for renewal. This provision only applies to the 22-23 fiscal year. 
So those licenses have been issued. It does not seem prudent to try to retract those licenses, um, but it also doesn't seem the right solution to totally ignore the law that these folks have to have the test. So this is the compromise that we proposed to Pepsi. This was this was not controversial on Pepsi. This was uni uni unanimously endorsed by Pepsi. Uh, but this is a request to the state board to offer that that policy provision. Section 180, permit to teach. Um, removes condition that an applicant cannot apply for a permit to teach if he or she qualifies for any other type of license and clarifies that the permit to teach is valid only until June 30th of the school year in which it was requested. So one of the things we've, we've tried to build here is a scaffolded entry into the residency license for those career changers. You don't have enough content to qualify for an emergency, you can, you can use a, a permit. But we also wanted to offer that full flexibility. Even if you had enough credit hours to qualify for an emergency, let's let these folks gradually come into this. And all this says is, even if you qualify for an emergency, you can still hold a permit if that's the way you, if that's the approach you want to take. Um, but we are stipulating that regardless of when we issue you that permit to teach, if it's December 1st, it's only good until June 30th of the following of that fiscal year. Uh, it can't extend beyond a fiscal year. That Then that license would have to be converted over to an emergency license. And we are making the same provision for the emergency license. Um, it doesn't matter when you issue it within the fiscal year, it will expire on June 30th of that fiscal year. So Dr. Tomberland, yes, for clarity purposes then, if a school district issues a permit to teach, I don't want to say an emergency license, or permit to teach for that matter. Um, as late as I, this would probably be a rarity, but let's say it's issued in March, mm -hmm. that has to be renewed in three months. It has to be converted. There is no renewal. So you would have to you would have to switch over to an emergency license. And so the districts the districts need just to be aware of this because there are other solutions to that problem. You could make them the long-term sub for the rest of the – if you've got that short of a time, make them a long-term sub um, until the end of that school year, then put them on a permit for the following year. Um, it's just the clarity we want to uh, signal to the field. They're, they're very masterful at, at navigating all these things. So um, as long as they know what the rules of the game are, and that's – I think that's where we needed to make the clarifying statement. Thank you. Yep. Section 2.00, limited license, allows for an applicant who held an expired lateral entry license to be issued a limited license. Um, <clears throat> this, this just says any expired lateral entry license, you can, uh, as long as coursework requirements were met, and it's testing that was that was the issue that that person is eligible for a limited license um, because we felt we needed to overtly state that since we're stating in the policy that limited that lateral entry doesn't exist any longer but in this case an expired l lateral entry license could be used as the basis for an application for a limited license and I think that's all I have. So the first issue that uh, you have to consider this idea of whether a limited license, no, I'm sorry, too many licenses, mm -hmm. whether a residency <laughs> license, <laughs> I, I think that's going to be a quote, um, um, whether a residency license has to be issued and renewed all in, in one three-year period, um, or can that renewal extend out past the three years? And the, the caveat to that is 
regardless of whether you allow it to extend on those three years, the testing will have to be completed by the end of the third year of the issuance, mm -hmm. whether they renewed it or not. So that that's going to create some confusion for the field, I think. Um, and that's why we elected to go the way we did, but we want to we want to let folks know that the field is kind of concerned about this and feels that that's a piece of flexibility that they would they they need uh, for their teachers. So that the board can elect uh, that was this policy was approved by Pepsi, and we're very clear about this. The, this section uh, was approved by Pepsi, and. Um, the, the the concerns came up after the Pepsi meeting, and the chair discussed with me, let's go ahead and present it to the state board. If they want to send that piece back, we're happy to take it back and, and re-examine it. Well, what we need to do, my suggestion is that you write write up those, write up what you just described and get it to uh, Dr. Petrie Martin so that it is very clear and stands out in our uh, February Agenda Certainly, I can under do that. ESMP. And I believe it seems like there was something else. There was, there was one more, yeah. and that is the provision to allow those folks who are issued an, a residency license where they previously held a lateral, expired lateral entry. This, the policy is that they're required to test in order to get that residency license. In some cases, that did not happen. For those cases where it did happen, we're asking the board grant them a waiver from that until June 30th, 2023. Um, and if they don't meet the testing requirements by that time, then the then the RL cannot be renewed. Thank you, Dr. Oxendine and Dr. Tomlin. Thanks to you and your, your team um, for providing the clarity around these, these licensure issues. If there was ever any doubt that we need a Pathways to Excellence, that presentation just <laughs> answered the question. It is confusing. It's difficult to understand. It's complex. We need a simpler, more straightforward, more effective licensure system. But uh, we appreciate your, your good work, Dr. Tomlin, and your team's work, and Dr. Oxendine, your leadership on that. Let's now take a uh, break until 3.30. We'll reconvene at 3.30. <laughs>